Yes, yeah, so um, I welcome all of you again to this section of thermodynamics, MSC 451. Okay, this is the last portion of our lecture notes. Okay, hopefully if you are able to finish this, then the rest of the time we'll be using for solving past year questions, preparing ourselves for the exams and other uh, activities related to tests. Okay, and the assignment, of course. Okay, so uh, basically, what all that we have learned in chapter five, we are going to repeat them also in chapter six. Okay, so something like the ideal gas equations related to uh, internal combustion engines and so on, like this. Okay, so but this particular chapter is devoted to thermal power plants. Okay, so in this chapter, we'll be uh, learning something on Breton cycle. Okay, so we will know the ideal Breton cycle and then the deviation of Breton cycle from the idealized ones. And then we will look at Breton cycle with regeneration. Okay, so in order to increase the performance of the air standard cycle or the Breton cycle, we have to introduce what we call regeneration. And then we look at also the Breton cycle with interpooling, preheating, and regeneration. Then and the last part will be from number five to nine will be devoted to steam power cycle. So the Rankine cycle, Okay, to look at the deviation of the actual Rankine cycle from the ideal ones, and then the efficiency and so on. Okay, we'll look at reheating Rankine cycle and regenerative Rankine cycle. Okay, so now uh, the definition or introduction to power plant: a power station is a plant or is a power plant in which heat energy is converted into electrical power, okay? So in all steam power cycle, okay, or let's say any gas power cycle, we have the convection of uh, heat or thermal energy into electricity, okay? For example, in the TMB, so TMB people, they normally they, pro, they sell electricity, but they buy the electricity from steam power cycle, the power plant, okay? So then the power plant people will sell to TMB and then TMB will sell to the end users, okay? So this is the distribution uh, arrangement which is put in place. Then um, we have the most, uh, the most power stations contain one or more generators, a rotating machine, such as the turbine, that converts the mechanical power into electrical power. Okay, so the generator, the generator is a rotating device, it's a machine, okay, which sandwich between two, uh, between two, uh, what do you call, magnetic field, north and south pole. Okay, so the rotation of this, machine between the two magnetic fields and produces electricity or electrical power. And then there are various types of power plants. We have the gas turbine power plant. Okay. The working fluid is gas. And then we have the steam power plant in which the working fluid changes phase from liquid into vapor. Then we have nuclear power plant, hydroelectric power plant solar power plant, geothermal power plant, and then we have tidal waves, wind power plant, and so on. Now, our scope of thermodynamics is only related to gas power cycle and steam power cycle, only these two, okay? So maybe in future, if you want to become an expert in energy efficiency or energy system, then you will learn about all these things. Okay, so when I was doing my master's, I did 
something, my master's is related to energy system. So I learned so many things about all these fields. Okay, nuclear, power plant, hydroelectric, geothermal, tidal waves, wind energy. In the future, if you want to go into this particular field, then you have to learn about all these things. Okay, now gas power plant or gas turbine. Okay, uh, it's used for power production. Okay, and uh, generating transfer jet proportion. Okay, so uh, the aircraft that we see is normally uh, based on, or the working principle is based on the gas power or the gas engine, gas power plant. Okay, so, or the gas turbine, very sorry, gas turbine, yes. So the gas turbine engines have a great power to weight ratio compared to reciprocating engines. Okay, so when you say reciprocating engines, we are referring to internal combustion engines, such as Maevi, Produa, whatever it is. Okay, so but the gas power, gas, sorry, the gas turbine, okay, has a light weight and it has more power compared with reciprocating engine. Okay, that is smaller than reciprocating uh, counterpart of the same power. Now, the main disadvantage is compared to reciprocating engine of the same size, they are expensive. Okay, so the aircraft uh, gas turbines are very, very expensive. Okay, and then because they spin at such high speed, high rotation, okay, and because of the high operating temperatures. So most ga gas power cycles are operated at extremely high temperature than internal combustion engine. Okay, so now and the gas turbine also tend to use more fuel when they are idle. Idle means they are not in use, but they are rotating. And they prefer a constant rather than a fluctuating load. Okay, so now these are the various features of the gas turbine. You see, here in the gas turbine, we have the intake. The intake is the compressor. So these are the compressor blades. So the compressor blades are this. So the air is admitted, fresh atmospheric air is admitted into the compressor, and then the air is compressed. Okay, the air passes through uh, the compressor blade. It is compressed to a very, very, very high pressure. So somehow the temperature increases a little bit. And then the fluid enters what we call the combustion chamber. Okay, so in the combustion chamber, we have the fuel. Mainly the fuel they use is gas, uh, uh, what do you call it? They use gas, okay, fuel gas. And then uh, the combustion takes place over here. So after the combustion, a very high supersonic speed, high speed fluid or flue gas, exhaust, okay, is produced. And it forces it with its way through what's called the turbine. So then the turbine blade will be rotating at very high speed. And this is the place where the power is produced. And then the exhaust passes through the nozzle into the atmosphere, okay? Now, the gas, the working principle of the gas turbine is like this. Like I told you, we have the intake, atmospheric air enters, there is a compressor, it compresses the air to a high pressure. Okay, then the air enters the combustion chamber. Okay, so the combustion takes place and then the turbine rotates. Okay, so through this power is produced. And it is this power which is used to uh, light the aircraft. Okay, so operate other motors and other things.
Okay. Now, if let's say we want to uh, make a schematic diagram of the gas power cycle, okay, this is called an open open cycle. Open open cycle. Open cycle because the air comes in and then we have the exhaust going out into the atmosphere. Okay, so the same thing over here. We have atmospheric air enters the turbine, sorry, compressor. So the fluid is compressed to a high pressure and then it goes into the combustion chamber. And then fuel enters. So now there will be combustion taking place. The product of combustion is admitted into the turbine. So now the turbine produces network output and then the exhaust from the turbine is emitted into the atmosphere. Okay, so we have closed gas uh, power cycle and open gas power cycle. Okay, so now like uh, we have mentioned before, you see, we are now going to look at the ideal Brayton cycle. See, so the Brayton cycle is the air standard ideal cycle approximation for the gas turbine engine. I think I have told you in chapter five that most of the internal combustion engine, the act actual internal combustion engines, they do not follow real thermodynamic cycle. So we need to impose certain assumptions, such as the air standard assumption on them. And by means of this, we will be able to make certain assumptions in order to reduce the complexity of this gas and, or gas power cycle into a simple uh, 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 situation where we can easily apply our laws of thermodynamics and then solve the quantities that we required. Okay, so the same issue also over here. The, the, gas, the gas engine or the turbine, the gas turbine engine, the actual gas turbine engine cannot follow real thermodynamic cycle. Why? If you look over here, one of the reasons is that we have atmospheric fresh air enters the gas turbine and then the air is compressed into through the compressor okay into the combustion chamber so now from this combustion chamber the working fluid the properties of the working fluid is different than the properties at the inlet now after the product of combustion is exhausted to the atmosphere, same thing, the properties of the working fluid over here, its properties are different. So it is very easy to, uh, to trace, okay, the way the fluid is moving through the aircraft. You cannot know at which state, what is the uh, physical properties or chemical properties of the of the working fluid because it is changing at each particular stage. So we need to make an assumption that the working fluid throughout the cycle is what? Air. And this air needs to behave as an ideal gas. If you don't make this assumption, then there is no way in which we'll be able to solve the, uh, that uh, thermodynamic analysis of this particular system. Okay, so one or the primary assumption is that the working fluid is only air, right from the inlet up to the exhaust. Okay, so that's the one of the basic assumptions. And the air we use behaves as an ideal gas. All right, so now the combustion, yes, also the combustion process is replaced by a heat by a constant pressure heat addition process. So you see clearly over here, 
Uh, let's see the difference. So you see over here that uh, we have fuel and air entering this combustion chamber. So this gives rise to a different uh, chemical composition of the working fluid. So the working fluid over here is air, and here we have air and fuel, and then here we have product of combustion. So what we are going to do is that we are going to replace this combustion chamber by a heat addition process. So it means that we will take out the, the fuel. So only air goes inside, and then we transfer some amount of Q in into this combustion chamber. Okay, and that's what we have over here. You see? So the combustion, this time there is no fuel. We have only atmospheric air entering. And the heat is transferred in order to heat up the, the air. Okay, so throughout the cycle, even the exhaust from this heat exchanger is air. Okay, so then the air enters the turbine at high temperature and pressure. So the, it is expanded, the air is expanded in the turbine. And then eventually it is uh, exchanged heat with this con uh, uh, the heat exchanger. So eventually heat is rejected, okay, by means of uh, heat transfer, okay, from the system to the surrounding. And then the cold air is again recycled through the process again, like this. Okay, so now let us see for each particular case what is uh, the process involved. Now we see that when we are changing from, from let's say, uh, from actual cycle, the actual cycle is called the Brayton cycle. Brayton. Brayton cycle. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yes, so the, the actual cycle. So the actual cycle is converted into what we call ideal Breton. Ideal Breton cycle. Breton cycle. Breton cycle. Okay? So the actual cycle is the gas power cycle. And when we impose the assumptions on this, then it is no longer actual cycle, but instead ideal Breton cycle. Okay? So now let us look at the processes involved in this ideal Breton cycle. First, we have isentropic. So you see, the compression is even isentropic. And what is isentropic process? An isentropic process is a reversible process. You understand me? So isentropic process means the change in entropy, delta S, between the two states is equal to zero. And whenever you have such mathematical uh, and uh, what do you call it? Mathematical equation like this. So it means the change in entropy, S2 equals to S1. And this expression is known as isentropic process. You understand me? So isentropic process is a constant entropy process. All right. So now uh, on the TS diagram, temperature and entropy diagram, we have isentropic processes given by this from state one to two. And on a PV diagram, this isentropic process is given by this, on a PV diagram. And then when the fluid enters the heat exchanger, okay, then we have constant, constant pressure heat addition. And on a TS diagram, constant pressure heat addition is given by this. And then again, we have on the, the expansion process from state 
three to four. We have high centropic expansion in what? In the turbine. And this again is given by isentropic expansion. And then the final one is the constant pressure heat rejection, which is Q out. You understand? So this is the constant pressure. It's very, very important to know how to draw this PV and TS diagram for the gas power cycle. Now, these equations. They are not new to us, okay? We have seen them several times, especially in chapter five, okay? So for any isentropic process, feel free to use this equation. P1 over P2 equals to V2 divided by V1 divided by to the power K, which equals to T1 divided by T2 raised to the power K divided by K minus one. Then the work done, See, the work input to the compressor is given by the change in entropy between the inlet and the, the exit. We have established the energy balance for, uh, for a pump in Chapter 3, for compressors also in Chapter 3, for nozzle, for diffusers. We have established all the appropriate energy balance. So I'm not going to waste my time over here. You can refer back in chapter three, all right? So now, uh, if you look carefully, the change or the work input to the tab, sorry, compressor is given by H2 minus H1. But I've told you, again, if the working fluid is an ideal gas, the enthalpy of an ideal gas is always proportional or equals to Cp times the temperature of that, uh, of the working fluid. So if we know this definition, then we can replace H by this. Okay, be, fair, be careful. You should know the difference between H and small h. This is specific enthalpy, and this is absolute enthalpy. And specific enthalpy equals to absolute enthalpy divided by mass, okay? So now, uh, yes, if we do that, then we have, uh, we replace over here, we will have H equals to M times small h. Okay, so now uh, if you replace absolute, let's see over here, or right over here, so we'll have something like this. So we have something like this, WC, okay, equals to H2 minus H1. So now I can write WC equals to M mass flow rate, mass flow rate of the working fluid, M2, okay, times H2 minus M1, H1. But again, this is a control volume system. And if the mass flow rate M1 equals to M2 equals to M, then we can factorize M out. So eventually we'll have uh, this WC equals to mass flow rate H2 minus what? Minus H1, all right? So but we want to express it in that, be careful. The unit for this is in kilowatt. Kilowatt or watt. Now, we can express it in kilojoules per kilogram. That is in specific form. By dividing, if I divide this equation by mass flow rate, I divide this also by mass flow rate. M will cancel M. And W, small w, C, is equivalent to Big W with dot divided by mass flow rate. Okay, so then eventually we will have W, WC equals to H2 minus H1. But so we have 
WC equals to H2 minus H1. But then, uh, since I've told you, the CP, sorry, enthalpy is can be defined by this for ideal gas. So we can take, so we can rewrite WC equals to CP into bracket T2 minus T1. Okay, so this is a very common equation, which is widely used. So now, if you want to calculate how much heat is added to the system, Q in, okay? So then we have to establish the energy balance for the heat exchanger. This we have also done already before, okay, in the chapter three, okay, in which we mentioned, actually this is supposed to be Q dot and this M dot. Okay, so uh, if you go back to the fundamental, it should be Q dot equals to mass flow rate H3 minus H2. But because we have H equals to Cp times temperature, that is why we got this equation like this. Okay, and this again is nothing, it is equal to the combustion efficiency, mass flow rate of the fuel times the calorific heating value. All right, so now for the isentropic expansion process, so these two equations, they are synonymous, they are similar. Okay, for the, this is expansion for the turbine, right? This expansion for the turbine and the change in enthalpy or the work delivered by the turbine is expressed in this form. Okay, now for the Q out, it is very easy. So Q out is also expressed in this form. Now, thermal efficiency for the Brayton cycle can be expressed as thermal efficiency for the Brayton cycle can be expressed by W net divided by Q in. And this again equals to one minus Q out divided by Q in. And again, this equals to one minus one over R, RP raised to the power K minus one divided by K. Where RP, be careful, RP is the pressure ratio, okay? RP, it's not compression ratio. RP is pressure. Pressure, pressure ratio, okay? Now, uh, let us look in detail the effect of the pressure ratio on the efficiency of the Brayton cycle. We can see from here that the efficiency of this Brayton cycle depends largely on RP. If more RP, then the whole of this denominator will become bigger. So then the whole of this will be smaller and we will have one minus a very small value. So then the, it means the efficiency was going to increase. It means when you go on increasing the value for RP increases, then the efficiency increases. But after a certain uh, pressure ratio, there is no significant increase in the efficiency. Okay, so the range, the range of the pressure ratio falls within, uh, let's say, 5 and 20. All right, so now uh, we want to define a new term called back work ratio. Okay, back work ratio is WC divided by WT. Okay, R back work ratio equals to WC divided by W, WT. All right. So if you uh, make a substitution for WT and WC, 
then you you arrive at this equation okay so uh, we will look at these questions later on now let us look at the deviation so in the beginning of this class we were told that we're going to look at the deviation of the actual gas power cycle from the ideal cycle okay and this brings us to the concept of uh, isentropic efficiency now one of the main reasons for the deviation of the actual cycle is irreversibilities in a turbine okay so what are irreversibilities pressure drop heat loss is one of them and friction all these things constitute the irreversibility of a system okay so and one of them yes these are the agents the agents which are responsible for the irreversibility of a system you can take for example your motorcycle your motorcycle the moment you stand on the engine heat thermal energy will be produced inside the engine the engine become very hot this heat will be some of the heat will be dissipated to the surrounding okay and some portion of the heat that is produced from the combustion, this is what is used to lift up the piston, so the piston will be lifted up and down. And even then, because you cannot avoid friction, there will be friction between the piston and then the cylinder, which again will produce some, uh, what do you call it, thermal energy. All right? So there are so many uh, causes of irreversibilities of a system, all right? So all these things, when you put them together, they tend to reduce the efficiency of the system or the, uh, the, 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 the cycle, okay? So if we look into this particular diagram, so we define isentropic efficiency this is isentropic efficiency for the compressor. Isentropic efficiency is the, uh, the work done. See, here, when we are compressing the gas in a compressor, so we have the compressor like this. Okay, the fluid enters and then it exits at high pressure. Right? So now, this is S1, this is S2. All right. So now, if this S1 equals to S2, then this compressor is an isentropic compressor. So it means that it is going to follow this part vertically. However, for actual compressor, okay in which there is pressure loss there is friction there is heat loss which cannot be avoided then for such situation s2 is never equals to s1 in most cases s2 is greater than s1 you understand me s2 will be greater than s1 and that's what we have over here you see, this is the, the, the horizontal axis, that's the entropy. So there will be, uh, it is going to deviate a little bit, okay, from the actual cycle, like this, all right? So it is from this actual and then the reversible cycles that we define the isentropic efficiency for the turbine, sorry, for the compressor. So it is WS divided by WA. So that's why... If then it becomes the change in enthalpy, the change in entropy between the two states. Similarly, we can define the isentropic efficiency for the turbine. Also, it is the actual work done from the turbine. So this is just the actual work done from the turbine, which is this. Divided, this is the WA, and this is WS. All right. So also, 
when the fluid is flowing through the heat exchanger, the pressure continues to reduce. That's why we have the dotted line. And when it is flowing through the, again, the heat exchanger for the cooling part, again, the pressure difference is, and uh, there is pressure difference. There is pressure drop. So all these things constitute the reversibility of the system. Okay. Now let us look at uh, development of gas turbine. Okay. Now there are some possible ways. Okay, three main possible ways to increase the efficiency. Yes, so there are three possible ways to increase the efficiency of the cycle. One of them to increase the turbine inlet temperatures. Okay. The other one increasing the efficiency of the uh, turbo machinery, namely the turbine and compressors, and adding modification to the basic cycle, means intercooling, regeneration, and re cooperation and reheating, all right? So let's see, but you see in every gas turbine, there are limitations which are imposed on the turbine blades, okay? So the turbine blade is made up of a material and this material cannot survive under extremely high temperature. So if, let's say, normally from the manufacturing side, the manufacturer will tell you this gas turbine should not be operated above 1,500 Kelvin. If you operate continuously above this temperature, there will be corrosion. Okay, so high temperature corrosion in the turbine. And then the turbine will not last, then you need to remove the blades. Okay, so uh, at various RPs, let's see, for example, if the RP for a particular cycle is equals to two, means pressure ratio, okay, most likely their efficiency will be in this region, okay? And the more, so the network output, sorry, this is the W net work output. And if you increase the, what do you call it, the RP, then again, the network output, again, is going to increase. If you continue going, increasing this RP up to a certain value, then the, uh, the network output becomes uh, equal to this particular region. All right? But however, you see that for all the three cases, they are limited within this temperature, high temperature. And then the low temperature is this, 300 Kelvin. Mostly the lower temperature is at the ambient temperature, okay? Now this is the Breton cycle with regeneration. So this is one of the opportunities which is available to increase the efficiency, okay? By integrating a regenerator. So how does it work? Now let's see. So air enters the compressor at state one and gradually the air enters the compressor and sorry, exits the compressor at high pressure. So but we don't want the air to go directly into the combustion chamber. We try to preheat the air from the hot gas, which is coming from the turbine. Maybe the temperature, let's say T4, is about 600, 600, uh, let's say, uh, Kelvin. Okay, so this 600 Kelvin should not be allowed to go directly into the surrounding. 
Maybe the temperature over here is about 350 Kelvin. So we can preheat this fluid by means of this hot gas. So means maybe by the time the temperature will come to state 5, T5 will be about, let's say, approximately 500 Kelvin before the fluid will enter the combustion chamber. So in this way, we are saving some energy. Instead of allowing this to go to the surrounding atmosphere, we pass it through this channel and its heat is transferred. So eventually, maybe the temperature at the exit of this will, could be about 400 Kelvin, like this. Okay, so, and, or let's say uh, it could be about three, six, five fifty Kelvin. Okay, now if we look onto the TS diagram, so the TS diagram tells us that from state one to state two is isentropic compression. All right, and then from state two to state three, this is constant pressure heat addition. Two to three. Okay, let's consider that first. And then three to four is isentropic expansion. And finally, four to uh, one. Back to one. That is constant pressure, heat rejection. Now, watch out over here. You see, if we now into introduce the regenerator, okay, so what the regenerator does is that the temperature at the exit, that is T4, when this temperature is reducing, then the temperature T2 will be increasing gradually up to state 5 means this T4 will be reducing, but T, T2, T2 will be increasing, moving gradually, gradually to T5. You understand me? So at T5, this, the heat now gets to T6. So now this T6 is rejected to the surrounding. So eventually, it moves directly to state one. Okay, so now uh, at state five, at state five, this is where the, uh, let me redraw this diagram. So at state five, now the fluid enters the combustion chamber. At this combustion chamber, we will add Q in in this combustion chamber. And that Q in start from state five, all the way up to state three. So the actual Q in is Q five to three. You understand me? Now, this is the maximum, the maximum value that the regenerator can go is five dash. There is no way in which this T4, okay? Uh, sorry, there is no way in which uh, we can have T5 dash greater than T4. The highest it will go is that they can be equal. All right. So if we really want to make use of this T4, then the maximum by which the regenerator can go is up to this state. It cannot go more than that. But this is the actual, the actual situation is this. So from this, we can define what we call the regenerator effectiveness. The regenerator effectiveness is the actual Q. This is Q actual. This is called Q actual divided by Q maximum. Q maximum is this. This is Q maximum. You understand me? So we define effectiveness of the regenerator equals to Q actual 
divided by Q maximum. All right? So now, what is this Q actual for the regenerator? It is H5 minus H2. And similarly, Q regenerator maximum is H5 dash minus H2, which is the same as H4 minus, look over here, T4 is the same as T4 dash, sorry, T5 dash. Okay. Now, like I've told you, regenerative efficiency, effectiveness is defined in this. So in terms of the enthalpies, it can be expressed in this way. Now, for the ideal gas, using the cold air standard assumption with constant specific heat, the regenerator effectiveness becomes this. So it means if you replace, let's say, uh, we replace H equals to Cp times temperature, then the regenerator effectiveness can be equal to this. Okay, so now we can define that and the regenerator efficiency, which is equal to, it can be expressed in terms of the temperature in this form. Okay. So then next, we have the Breton cycle with regenerator. The Breton cycle with regenerator is most effective at low pressures, at low pressure ratio, and low minimum to maximum temperature ratios. Okay. So, if you look at the efficiency and then the pressure ratio, for situations in which there is no regenerator, this is the efficiency for profile. The profile for the efficiency is like this. Okay? So, this is without regenerator. And if you introduce a regenerator, then the efficiency increases somehow with this, okay? But knowing that the temperature ratio, that's the maximum temperature and minimum temperature, the ratio equals to 0 0.2. And this, the, the ratio of the temperature is 0 0.25, and then it continues to increase this way, all right? Next. The Breton cycle with intercooling, reheating, and regenerator or regeneration. So now we have uh, <clears throat> two compressors and two stage turbines. Okay, two stage compressors and two stage turbines with intercooling and regeneration between them. Okay, so even if anything at all in your final exams, then questions should be expected in these areas. Okay? So here, the situation is like this. We have two turbines, sorry, two compressors. So the first compressor compresses the fluid. But when the fluid exits at stage two, its temperature increases. So it has to be cooled down. So that's why we introduce this intercooler. All right, so pressure remains the same, but the cooling process takes place. And then the fluid enters the compressor at state two. Then before the fluid is reheated from the regenerator, and then eventually it exits the regenerator at state five and enter the combustion chamber. So then the fluid is expanded in the first turbine so when the expansion takes place, temperature reduces. So it is reheated again at constant pressure before it enters the second compressor, sorry, second turbine. And then the fluid or the exit of this particular turbine is connected to the regenerator like this. So if you look on the TS diagram, on our TS diagram we have one to two is isentropic compression. Two to three, that is constant pressure, heat rejection in the wet, in the intercooler. Then three to four, isentropic expansion or compression. 
three to four in the compressor. Then we have uh, four to five. That is the regeneration. So from four up to five, there is the regeneration. Regeneration means that the temperature, watch over here, temperature from state nine is decreasing and temperature three to five is increasing. So once this temperature is decreasing, then this one is increasing in this way. But the maximum, the maximum, so one thing you can discover over here, the maximum uh, regenerator is the same as the actual. So this is 100% efficient. All right. So now uh, our Q in start from state five all the way to state six before the fluid is eventually expanded again in the first turbine and then it is reheated at constant pressure and then again re-expanded in the second turbine before it is again rejected. Okay, so it is and it enters the regenerator over here. Now, important thing we need to know regarding this is the pressure ratio. All right? So pressure ratio, uh, RP equals to the exit pressure, P2 divided by P1 for the first compressor. And this is the same as P4 divided by P3 for the second compressor. And for the turbine, for the turbine, the pre I'll say this is compressor and RP for the turbine equals to the exit pressure. Okay, so P6. Okay, so this gives us uh, P6 divided by P7. P6 divided by P7. And this is uh, the same equals to P8 divided by P9. Okay, so this is how to estimate the pressure ratio. Now, we will look at the Brayton cycle with multi-stage compression. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. So the one we have just seen now uh, is the same as multi-stage compression and expansion. Okay. When we say multi-stage compression with intercooling, it means the working fluid required to compress gas between two specific pressures. And then this can be decreased by carrying out the compression process in stages and cooling the gas in between. This keeps the specific volume as low as possible. And similar thing refers to multi-stage expansion with reheating, okay? So this is the situation. If you have, let's say, this particular situation on the TS diagram, we have so many uh, compression, multi-stage. Okay, so you can say this is about 10 or let's say eight compressors working in stages like this. Okay, and this is also multi-stage expansion. Okay, now, Yes, so this is another question. We will discuss these things later on. Okay, so uh, I'll give a brief introduction to the steam power cycle, and then we will stop over there, and then uh, we will try to complete it in the next class. Okay, so then if you have time, we will start solving questions. All right, so uh, here we are talking about steam power cycle. In a steam power cycle, mostly the working fluid is water, right? So we have a boiler. So what is the function of the boiler? The function of the boiler is to produce steam at high temperature. And this steam is transferred to the steam turbine. 
and the steam turbine is connected to a generator which produces the electricity and the exhaust of the turbine is sent to the condenser. So this is an example of a, a, a power plant station in Klan, okay, Klan Valley. So in Klan Valley, there are a lot of power plants, especially in Slango. Okay, now let us look at the basic introduction to this steam power cycle. This is theoretically coming from the Carnot cycle. We all know the Carnot cycle already. So a Carnot cycle is a, is a heat engine that operates between two temperature reservoirs. Okay, so it, it operates in a cyclic process and all its processes are reversible process. Okay, so the basic concept of the Carnot cycle is that all the, process in, all the processes involved in the Carnot cycle are reversible. Okay, so now if we have, for example, and this is a, an example of a Carnot cycle where we have a pump which is uh, installed. So the use of this pump is to compress, sorry, is to pump the fluid. So water is an incompressible fluid. Okay, so uh, state one to two is isothermal heat addition. Okay, and let me see over here. Instead, so I think if we have to go by this diagram, so then the, the statement over here is wrong. So this is supposed to be, uh, let me see, So, one to two is isothermal heat addition in boiler. It should be, uh, let me change this. This should be four to one. This should be four to one. Okay, and then isentropic expansion in the turbine should be three to four. Three to four. Sorry for that. Okay, so I'll write here. This is four to one. This is three to four. And then isothermal heat rejection. Okay, in the condenser. And uh, let's see. Oh, and for the, the boiler, it should be three to, this should be two to three. And this is rather four to one. And then we have uh, isentropic compression in the compressor one to two okay one to two okay so this should be the process so one to two that is the isentropic compression normally this is a pump so we cannot put a compressor for this so this should be a pump okay so then two to three is constant pressure Isothermal, two to three is isothermal heat addition. Constant temperature heat addition. And then we have four to, four to one, sorry, and three to four is isentropic expansion, expansion in the turbine. All right. Now, uh, this diagram again can be Related to this one on the right, where we have the heat engine is embedded over here, and it is operated between two temperature reservoirs. Okay, heat energy is taken from high temperature reservoir, and part of this heat is converted into work, and the rest of the heat is rejected to a lower temperature heat sink. All right, so one to two, that is isentropic compression in the, in the pump. And two to three, this is constant temperature, heat what? Heat input. And then three to four is isentropic expansion, and four to one is constant temperature, heat rejection. Now the thermal efficiency for this cycle is W divided by QA, which can be expressed by this. All right. 
Now, there are some weaknesses, okay, and in which uh, it is associated with the canon cycle. So the canon cycle, theoretically, it is good. Practically, it is very weak. We cannot implement it practically. You understand me? So the canon cycle is a highly valid and useful when it comes to theory. But in practical situation, it is really, uh, it cannot help. You understand me? So uh, we are saying that the canon cycle is the most efficient operating and a cycle operating between two specific temperatures limits. But it is not suitable model for power cycle. Because of what? Process one to two. Okay, limiting the heat process to two phase. So process one to two, process one to two, assuming you are heating the fluid. This is constant temperature. And the fluid over here is in the saturated liquid state. This is saturated vapor state. So imagine you are pouring saturated vapor into the turbine. How much energy can you get? Very, very, very small. You understand me? So basically, to be working under two-phase region is not desirable for the power plant. All right? So we are saying uh, this severely limits the maximum temperature that can be used in the cycle. Now, process two to three, the steam cannot handle steam with high moisture. So you see, here immediately after the expansion, just after the expansion, a lot of water starts coming into the turbine. So the turbine cannot produce any meaningful work. Okay? Next, we have the Four to one, process four to one, it is not practical to design a pump to pump that handles two phase. You see, here we have saturated liquid vapor mixture. Normally, if you want to pump a fluid, it should be in the saturated liquid state, not saturated liquid vapor mixture. Okay? So these are the classical reasons why the kernel cycle it cannot be used. So now we will make a modification of the kernel cycle. And the modification of this kernel cycle is referred to as the ideal Rankine cycle. So the ideal Rankine cycle for vapor power cycle. Okay. So uh, let's see. So you see now, instead of the fluid here, one of the biggest modifications we have made is that all the components, the pump, the boiler, turbine, and condensers, they remain the same. But their operation is going to be different in some way. Like this, instead of allowing the fluid to be pumped into the uh, boiler at saturated liquid vapor mixture, we continue to cool it down up to saturated liquid state before eventually it is pumped into the boiler. You understand me? So two to three, even though it is isentropic compression, it is done at compressed liquid state. All right? So then again, we have heat addition process takes place at different temperatures, not at constant temperature. In the, in the kernel cycle, the heat addition takes place at constant temperature. You see, the classical are different. So here the heat addition is taking place at varying temperature, but at constant pressure. Pressure is constant, because this is a constant pressure line. You understand? Only the temperature is changing. Pressure is constant. And then the fluid is expanded at superheated state, not at saturated vapor state. So continue to expand. So this is very desirable for the and steam power cycle. Okay, so these are the basic modifications. So one to two is isentropic compression, two to three constant pressure heat addition, isentropic expansion, then we have constant pressure heat rejection. Okay, 
So uh, I would like to stop over here. So inshallah, we'll try to complete this slide in the next class. Okay, let me know if there is any question, if there is any question related to what we have just discussed now, please let me know. No, no, no. All right, thank you very much.